Okay, so we now welcome on another very special guest. He's a former DC United player and now is currently on playing in Belgium for St. Troyden. Uh, we welcome on Chris Durkin. Thanks for coming on today, Chris. What's up, guys? Thanks for having me. Yeah. So how's, uh, how's life been in Belgium right now? You just um, signed a uh, full-time contract with the, your team, St. Troyden. So how's that been for you? Yeah, well, for one, it's uh, relieving, you know. Uh, I was here on loan from, from DC United, and to finally have that permanent deal over here in Belgium is just like a weight lifted off my, so my shoulders, I feel like. And uh, I'm just really excited. You know, we just had our first game um, of the season. And that went really well, and now we're looking forward to playing against Anderlecht uh, tomorrow. So um, it's been a, you know, a pretty difficult start to the season just with the fixtures, but um, just life here has been great and I'm really enjoying it and um, it's been everything that I've wanted so far. So you said you have your it's the second game of the season tomorrow? What yeah, go, second game. What goes into a game like preparation for that? What are you doing today today to prepare for your game tomorrow? Yeah well for one it's a lot of set pieces you know you don't want this session to be too heavy uh, the game uh, or the, uh, the session before uh, before the game. So, you know, just kind of sharp, uh, sharp passing drills um, and then a little bit of agility with reactions, just kind of get the uh, um, the brain thinking a little bit. And um, then, you know, just full, fully focusing on how well structured we are defensively and offensively with set pieces. Um, and just from a mentality standpoint, um, for, for myself personally, just, you know, knowing what my job and responsibility is for the game uh, tomorrow and, uh making sure that I'm checking on my boxes, you know, making sure that uh, I'm eating right, I'm, I'm hydrating because it's going to be a little bit warm. Um, and just overall just being a really, you know, a sound pro uh, with my approach to um, to the game. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, – yeah, I can definitely understand that. Um, another question was, like <coughs> – sorry. Do you guys – like, is that intensity different for, like, the pregame session? Well, like, the pre – yeah, yeah, like, the pregame session than it would be for, like, for, like, a regular practice? Yeah, the intensity is definitely different, but I think the intention is even uh, even stronger. You know, our focus on any drill, although it may not be um, necessarily uh, you know, high intensity or um, very, in uh, like, taxing on the body, it's going to be very, you know, intense with our focus – um, and, you know, super driven and, and just knowing that we're trying to prepare because uh, like our coach says now, our preparation um, or what we do on the field for the 90 minutes is not, does not happen when that whistle blows. Our preparation started on Monday and, you know, our entire you know, week of training leading up to that is what prepares us and really how, how we win the game. So uh, we've had a good week of training, so we keep that preparation going and we know that we have confidence coming into the game against Anderlecht. Um, basically uh, knowing that we've done everything that we can. Now it's just 11 men versus 11 men, and we have to show up. So the, the intensity is different, but our focus is 100% there. Um, yeah, I know that you made your debut against uh, Club Bruges. Is that, is that how you say it? Club Bruges, yeah. Club Bruges. Like, how was that? Like, how was, like, the intensity going, like, playing against, like, a Champions League team or a team that's, like, at, like, such a high level? Yeah, I mean, that was a surprise for me personally because um, we have a meeting before uh, before our games, a video meeting with, you know, some more set pieces and stuff. And I was just chilling because I thought I was, you know, I was in the 18-man roster, but pretty sure that I'm going to be on the bench because uh, I hadn't played a huge part yet. Um, there was a new coach that came in, and we kind of hit it off well with, uh, you know, our relationship. Um, and we're just looking at the PowerPoint, and next thing you know, you see the starting lineup going on the screen. And then you see 32 Durkin on starting, and, you know, then I'm like, oh, oh my God. <laughs> my first start is about to be against Club Bruges. You know, I have to man mark the golden boot winner of last year. And um, it just comes down to, again, preparation and, and knowing that, you know, I've been here for four or five months feeling my way through it, and now this was finally my opportunity. And like you said, it was against the Champions League team, a really quality team. And um, we uh, we actually scored the first goal on them and unfortunately conceded two. We lost two one, but thought I had a pretty good running in that, and that kind of led off to you know a good consecutive amount of games played for me. But you know I think you know what better way to you know get a taste for Belgium than to start with the champions of last year, 
uh, and kicking it off right away against them. So it was great and a really good learning experience. Yeah, I feel like it's definitely like when you're first starting, it's definitely good to just like get like thrown in. Like you, you don't have time to like overthink anything and yeah. you just go and play. Um, yeah, but, that's true because so many, so much stuff can go through your mind, you know, yeah. the night before if, uh, overthinking everything. Just to be thrown in right away, I, I agree with that. It definitely yeah. helps, probably. Um, a question I have is what uh, – one word to describe Belgian football. Um, what to describe Belgian football? Um, I think organized. It's, you know, a very structured, uh, structured environment within every team, you know. And it's a pretty level playing field, actually. You know, a lot of it's – any time you're going to play on the weekend, you're going to play against a team that's going to be pretty competitive. You know, the, the guy in uh, 18th place or the guy in first place, you know, it's going to be a really good game, I feel like. Um, and, you know, I've only been here for a year, so I'm still figuring my way out. I haven't – I've just started, you know, at the end of uh, last season to really start to find my minutes. And now, you know, finding more and more. Uh, so, you know, I'm finding my way through it, but – I've been really impressed with the with the league so far, and it's been it's been. Um, I don't I don't think Belgium is looked at as you know a top five or top maybe five league in Europe, but every t- all my teammates that I talk to and you know the experience that I've gained from others, you know they say that it's a really um, a really competitive league and you know difficult compared to to others throughout Europe as well. Yeah, for sure. Because I know um, you did play for DC. Like, what was the di- like the biggest? What's the difference? The biggest difference between like uh, American football and like Belgian football? Um, it's, it's a difficult question, and I get it a lot too. But you know, football is football at the end of the day. But I think th- where the biggest difference is is um, just our organization tactically. Um, just especially with within my team here, and then with compared with DC United. You know, DC United, we had our game plan. And, you know, sometimes we kind of veered off of it a little bit, um, you know, if we just weren't feeling right. Here, it's if we're not playing out of the back, our coach is going to get pissed. And um, if we're not, you know, uh, doing what we what the coach asks, then he's going to get mad. Um, there's not too much veering off of where we want to be. We play our game, and we don't care who we play. Um, we don't change the way we play too much. We just play our style of football and then kind of change it defensively a little bit. Um, and then, I mean, I came over here, um, one of being one of the fittest guys on the DC United team. And, uh, I wasn't fit enough to be, to be playing over here. Uh, so I had to put even more work in off the field with running and and my cardio, um, to actually be able to cover the distances needed, uh, in the center of the field here in Belgium. So I needed to, I I mean, last game I, I covered, um, I think 12,800 meters, which is like eight miles. Uh, so it's, it's a lot of running here in, uh, in the Belgian league, um, especially for, you know, a, a number eight, which I'm playing right now. So just a lot of different things. But, um, you know, like, for example, the MLS, you know, it's a pretty physical league. Um, and just we all know the travel of, of in, the, in the United States. That's a complete different thing. You know, I have to travel six hours to go from L.A. to uh, Washington, D.C., um, and then I have to travel around two hours for my longest uh, play, uh, my longest game here, two hours by bus. So it's completely different in terms of travel. Yeah. Um, it definitely is a lot. Just playing in a smaller country, that definitely is a lot ben- beneficial for you. Yeah. Um, for the derby matches, though, I feel like in – in like Europe in general, there's just so much more passion. Everybody cares about every single game that they play in. What's it like playing in a derby match against Ghent? They're your rival. So what's it like playing against them? Um, yeah, it's – my first experience against Genk um, was uh, I was on the bench getting warmed up, um, and we were losing 3-0 at halftime. And our, our fans were so pissed that they were throwing lighters and stuff at the other uh, goalkeeper on Gank. Um, and the game, the referee calls the game. We all have to go inside, wait 10 minutes. Our captain goes out on the field asking um, our fans, please be respectful. You know, I know the result's not going our way, but please don't throw anything on the field. We come out, um, probably around 30 minutes left in the game, losing 3-0. Um, and then we have a corner kick as our first play. We score on that goal. We score on that corner kick. 
Um, and then the floodgates open, and then we score two more goals. We tie the game up in the 90th minute, 3-3. Three, three. And then now their fans, the gang fans, are now trying to break through the barrier um, of, the, of, the, uh, of the stands um, and uh, trying to get on the field because they're pissed because they just blew a 3-0 <laughs> uh, uh, win. So, I mean, they had the police coming in with, with the, uh, the shields trying to keep them in. There's like a, a police dog like, like snapping at the players or at the, uh, at the um, fans. So, I mean, my first experience was pretty crazy. Um, and then you know, we go to Genk um, towards the lat later end of the year, uh, last year, and uh, we win two, uh, two to zero, or two to one, I believe, um, at their stadium. And their fans were all pissed. And, I mean, that was the most I've ever seen our fans celebrate. So, the, really, the, the Derby matches really, really mean a lot here. Uh, they're heavily televised, heavily watched. You know, everybody's coming to the game on the weekend when – we're play when we're playing gank here at uh, our stadium. So they're really, really exciting, and they really mean a lot. You know, like when the new rivalries of the MLS, like they call it El Trafico for, you know, LA Galaxy, yeah. um, LAFC. It just doesn't feel real yet. You know, it doesn't feel it has that tangible thing. You know, I know they try to make it with, like, Zlatan and Carlos Vela, but, you know, like this gank and St. Troy and rivalry, you know, lasts for, you know, 50 years maybe. So it's like – just that history, you know, I think really means a lot in those types of games. That is not there yet in MLS. Yeah, for sure. I know, like, with the whole coronavirus going on and stuff like that, like, there's no, like, fans at the stadiums and stuff. Like, how, di how much different is playing in front of fans than not playing in front of fans? Yeah, it's definitely different because, you know, you can really feel the support. It can either be a positive or a negative, you know, if you're playing against a big team. And like, for example, we go to club Bruges and we're playing in front of 35,000 people. Um, you're, if they score a goal, they're like, Oh God, now we're really feeling the atmosphere of the fans. And it just feels like it's just a constant wall coming at you. But if, you know, we're playing against, uh, let's say uh, if our fans were at the game against Gaint, uh, against Ghent uh, last, uh, last weekend, and we score that first goal in the first four minutes, now Ghent is going to feel even more on their heels and like, oh crap, like uh, we got to wake up. So it's, uh, it can go either way, but you know, I'm not too far away from, um, you know, playing academy soccer uh, like a couple of years ago. So I know what it's like to play with no fans um, and, you know, to kind of bring it upon myself to, to motivate myself to play in a, in a game. Um, but it's definitely interesting. You know, you can hear more of what the coach has to say. Um, and I guess you can be held a little more accountable for your communication. There's no excuse for communication now because um, everybody can hear anything. You know, when I remember in Atlanta United when we were playing in front of 70,000 people, you couldn't speak to the guy next to you um, to get it, to relay any information. So it's, it's definitely different, but um, obviously we really miss our fans a lot. It really just brings, it makes you feel more like a pro. It brings more of that atmosphere and, you know, like when we win the game last weekend, you know, we have to go celebrate uh, in front of our mascot instead of fans. So it's, uh, it's definitely different, but <laughs> yeah, we, we prefer them back for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So are you, would you say you're the only like English speaking like player on the team or is there like a lot of like, English speaking players? No, there's a lot actually. I was really surprised. Well, one, my, my coach is Australian. So oh, okay. he speaks perfect English. <laughs> Uh, our sports scientist is Australian. Um, I came here and initially thinking that I was going to have to learn the language completely <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, all that. And I know a couple words in Dutch right now, to be honest, because our sessions are done in English. Our video meetings are done in English. I can come up to anybody in a restaurant and order anything in English. So it's been a really easy transition for me. I know it's not as easy for, you know, like you guys just had Chris Richards on, you know, him coming over and having to learn German, you know, uh, with classes and all that stuff. Yeah. For me, it's been a completely different, you know, process. Although I'm only, you know, maybe a couple hundred miles away from him, it's completely different from my situation here than it is for, for him there with in terms of the language barrier. Um, but I think that's pretty much in Belgium across the board is it's pretty English uh, speaking he heavily English with all with all uh, Belgian clubs. But if you go, you know, an hour away into into Holland in the area of East, you know, they speak Dutch there uh, in every single club. So it's definitely, it's different, but it really helped me out a lot with my transition to uh, Europe. Nice. Um, so St. Jordan's obviously a small town. 
have you? I'm just curious. Have you ever seen just walking around? Have you ever seen anybody wearing a Chris Durkin jersey, like walking around on the streets at all? Nah, not yet. But <laughs> I hope I hope that changes soon because. You know, at first I wouldn't expect it. Who's this American kid coming over? Uh, who do you think he is? Um, but, you know, now that I, hopefully I'm becoming more and more a part of the team, more and more part of the starting 11, and I want to become more of that impact player for this team, maybe you might see a couple more jerseys. Yeah. I mean, I saw my jer- my jersey on sale last year, so maybe that's why it's like a, a little <laughs> – <laughs> wants to buy it. So we'll put some little bit of a 50% off on that. But so, – <laughs> Hopefully, you know, I start to see it a little more. I'm, I know my family members, maybe if you go around Richmond, Virginia, you'll see one of them walking it. <laughs> no, it's, that's, pro- that's probably so sick. I'm having trouble yeah. connecting to the internet. <laughs> Take a look at the help section in your Alexa app. <laughs> All right, so backing up a little bit, you made your debut for DC United. Um, was it when you were, you were just 16 years old? So, yeah. Or, no, you were, no, that was when you got signed. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Open Cup 16, 17, I think, for uh, MLS. Okay. So, Probably. what was it like for you? Like, at one point, did you realize that being a professional soccer player is what you wanted to be doing? Yeah, I think um, a big, you know, realization for me was um, the U uh, seventeen residency program. Uh, being around some of the top guys uh, in the country, and you know, realizing you know I can compete with this level you know, made me believe that I really can become a pro. Um, and, and that was a big part of my development down in Florida. Unfortunately, it doesn't exist anymore, the residency program. Um, but I know I thought, you know, DC United saw that I was one of the best youth players um, of my age at 17 years old. And, you know, then they took a chance on signing me. Um, and I had been with, a, with them for a couple of preseasons before I signed that homegrown contract. Um, but I'd always known deep down, you know, um, you know, when you, you, you put in a lot of work and you work as hard as you do, you know, you don't do it always. Um, you do it for the love of the game and you do it for that dream of becoming a pro. And I always had that in- intention to, you know, work as hard as I can to do as much as I could to become a pro. Um, and luckily that, that worked out. And, you know, I had a lot of support along the way with great coaches and, uh, you know, amazing parents to help support that dream. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, when you're younger, Jasper was telling – he played – Jasper, our producer, played with Chris when they were younger. He said you would commute from Richmond, like, which is, like, yeah. two hours away. So, just that commitment definitely is not something that everybody has, for sure. Yeah, exactly. You know, and that commitment – yes, I'm doing the, uh, the schoolwork and the car and stuff like that and sleeping when after training, but – the commitment comes to my parents, you know, and being able to drive, drive me two hours each way. And, you know, I can never say thanks enough because without them, then I wouldn't have gotten the chances that I, that I've had. Yeah. Um, kind of piggybacking off of that. We had Chris Richards on last week um, and he moved from Alabama to Texas just because just like there's lack of top um, youth soccer teams and academies in the U S I feel like. Do you think yeah. that's why the U.S. is kind of behind Europe when it comes to producing talent, just because it's so hard to for some people to get to certain places? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely difficult, you know, but um, I'll say one thing. At the same time, we've gone to the quarterfinals in the U-17 and U-20 World Cup in the past, um, past two or three years, um, and I think one other team in the world has done that. Um, we have the talent. Um, in, in the United States um, and we need the opportunity to develop more academies and now the developmental academy system has gone I think so it's like now what do we do I, I don't understand you know the direction of U.S. soccer right now and where we're going um, we need you know opportunities for everybody you know like we, we see people fall through the cracks of the system and uh, that's because you know there's not a club that's you know 20 minutes away or you have to drive an hour or two hours to get the best that you can to become a pro or to play with the best players in your, in your area. Um, and that's really difficult for some, some, uh, some families that, you know, work until eight o'clock. Uh, I was lucky that my parents had, you know, a flexible job to be able to take me uh, up to DC, you know, with uh, such long hours of commitment. 
So there's really a, a big question mark in terms of just the whole system and, you know, where are we headed in terms of our direction? You know, you see more and more 16, 17, 18 year olds leaving to go to Europe and Germany and Holland, uh, Spain and doing well, you know, we have the talent and now it's just about curating. How can we, you know, develop this talent in the best way? And personally, I thought that the residency program was, was a great, great avenue for us to, you know, develop chemistry within the U17 team um, and, you know, bring the best players together. And apparently we deemed fit that all academy uh, clubs can now produce uh, or can now uh, create that environment. So it's just, it's weird. And I'm not trying to dog on anybody, but, you know, there needs to be questions answered. And right now I feel like we took a step backwards and, you know, eliminating the academy and all that stuff. So it's just, it's really weird right now, I feel like. Definitely. Yeah. Um, Jasper told us that when you were, like, little, like, like younger, you went to – was it Inter Milan, like, academy for the summer to train? Yeah. How was, it the, how was that experience there? And, like, what did you, like, learn? And, like, the like the difference between, like, playing here and then playing there as well? Yeah. Um, I think I went over at around uh, 15 or 16, and I was playing with uh, Inter Milan D19 team, their Primavera which is uh, the sec basically their second team. Um, so it goes Primavera, and then it goes right to Inter's first team. Um, and some of those guys are pushing up into uh, uh, into the first team training with them. So I got to see, you know, guys my age who were up and training with the, uh, with the first team of Inter. And, you know, I thought I stood pretty well with them. Um, it was difficult. It's always difficult coming into, uh, you know, a team, um, especially, you know, as a younger kid, you know, they, they don't know as much English, especially, you know, when I was there, you know, you're, you're the guy in the locker room kind of sitting, you know, in the corner, like, well, I can't wait to train. So this isn't so awkward anymore. Uh, but like, you know, I thought it was, uh, it was a great, you know, learning experience. And, you know, I actually went to enter twice. Um, they, they allowed me to come back and, you know, continue to train and they were really happy with me. And, you know, we tried to get something done with uh, DC United and enter. Unfortunately, it didn't work out, but, um, you know, those experiences helped me, you know, to be where I am today, to be able to, you know, live by myself, live on my own over in Europe, you know, with my parents and family and girlfriend all back home in the States, you know, just be comfortable with that and, you know, start to experience the European level, you know, the professionalism, um, long hours, you know, there's a lot of double training sessions, you know, gym, then you go out, um, a lot of commitment to just the game and, you know, I saw that at a young age coming over here, and I think that really helped me out a lot. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I can definitely. I can definitely understand that. Um, when you made your debut at like seventeen, it was. Was it hard to like bond with like the older players and stuff like that? Uh, for me personally, no, because I've always been a guy. You know, people call me like an old soul sometimes, <laughs> where I just kind of, you know. Uh, I, I talk with, you know, older guys a lot, trying to gain experience from them, you know, learn from them. And, uh, you know, I've always enjoyed conversations with them, just hearing stories, you know, um, like guys like Steve Birnbaum and a, a lot of goalkeepers that, you know, just wanted to share, you know, what they, what they heard because, you know, something that is, you know, continually coming, uh, continually missing within the MLS nowadays is just that experience within uh, in the MLS, you know, a guy, an American guy that has like 10 years in the MLS, you know, you see a handful of those, you know, across the league. And, you know, to learn from – I've had guys like that on my team that I've been able to learn from. Um, but, you know, it was – I was really happy with the locker room in D.C. United. And, you know, I really learned a lot from them. And that's where you, you have the most fun, you know. Uh, it's when you get to go to the locker room and, you know, just chat with the guys and just um, just banter and all that stuff. That's, you know, one of the, one of the great things about just being, you know, uh, an, an athlete yeah um so what's you're talking about the, just in the locker room what's the in what's the locker room presence like of a somebody like um wayne rooney yeah i mean i'm sure you know we we all grew up with you know having posters on a wall of like you know our favorite team and uh, mine was manchester united and that player on my wall was wayne rooney you know so it, it was a really you know surreal experience you know of all teams that Wayne Rooney came from Manchester United to Everton then to DC United uh, nobody would have ever expected that and um, uh, so it was really just a shock you know to be able to meet him the first time and you know talk about a guy you know who has just so much experience and um, 
has won so many trophies. And um, I tried to pull as much information from him as possible without being that guy that's, you know, just constantly on his, sh on his shoulder. So maybe like throw a, throw in a question today to him or something, but you know, he was a great guy to banter with. And um, you know, if he, he walked into the room um, or into the locker room and he didn't know who he was, you wouldn't know that he was, uh, was Wayne Rooney, a guy with 250 uh, premier league goals and, yeah. So it was just, it was awesome to, to be able to learn from him. So what's something he taught, taught, like just taught you that off the pitch, just for your career in general, has he given you any advice about that? Uh, yeah, I think one thing that I learned from him was, well, one, I, I would be able to just, you know, hit long balls with him after practice and just watching his technique and um, his, uh, it's just natural ability. I, I learned a lot from that, just seeing you know, how good he was as just a soccer player technically. Um, but, you know, he, he was able to flip that switch of, you know, just kind of chilling and just kind of uh, talking with the guys to then being able to be like a, a full-blown beast on the field and just like not give a – doesn't give, give a crap about anybody or, you know, just putting people on the ground and stuff. Um, and then after the, after the practice, you know, just uh, – talking casually again. Um, so he, he was able to find that switch to flip it and, uh, you know, bring out that, that beast inside of him that, you know, we all kind of know. Yeah, Rooney is an, he's an absolute dog. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> especially in the earlier years, he was crazy. Yeah, yeah and then age, age comes in and then plays a little yeah. factor, but that's all right. <laughs> Would you say you, you model your game out, like you model your game after him then? Uh, I mean, I wish I was more of a striker, but I, I've had to come further and further back in my career towards the uh, center back and holding mid. Um, but yeah, I definitely try and model certain things after him. And, uh, you know, I also liked guys like David Beckham too, you know, um, those guys, you know, I really looked up to and to be able to learn from one of them um, and, you know, actually be able to analyze, you know, what he does. Um, that was, that was awesome. So as a fellow player who doesn't have blistering pace like Alfonso Davies, what, <laughs> how, how, like, what do you do just to stay at a high level? Yeah, I think it's all about, you know, reading the game and under your analysis of the game, putting yourselves in the proper position, um, to, you know, to not be uh, exposed uh, for lack of speed. Um, and I think that's, that's the most important thing is just using your brain. Because, you know, technically, you know, you, the slower guys are, you know, you normally tend to see slower guys like Busquets and uh, Xavi and these guys, you know, they might not be the fastest, but uh, they really use their brain um, to, to benefit on the field. Um, and I've tried to get continually better and better at that. You know, I can run for as long as I want, but, you know, trying to just hold my positioning more and, and having that, that – um, at sprint in the tank at all times to be able to get to get back as fast as I can or into the box as fast as I can. Um, yes, I'm, I'm going to get uh, done for speed by Alfonso Davies and um, uh, guys like that. <laughs> but um, sometimes you just have to uh, tip your hat to them and see like, yeah, I can't do that. But, you know, you can definitely put yourself in the best uh, situation for success positionally. Yeah. So, I want you to answer this question honestly. Are you satisfied with the 67 rating on FIFA? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, you, got, you want to work up uh, from somewhere, you know. I don't think I'm an 80 right now uh, or, or anything like that. I think I'm a silver right now. Is that true? Am I a silver yeah, card? I think yeah, yeah. That's good. I was a bronze and now I'm a silver. So that's, that's good. Moving up um, in the world. <laughs> moving up. <laughs> um, but – no, it's not. It's not great, but uh, to be honest, I don't really care about it that much. Uh, <laughs> nah, you got time. You got time. Yeah, I got time to build. And um, I, what I was more happy about was we went into the uh, preseason with DC United once. We had this uh, uh, photo booth that we went into with like eight different like HD cameras that we stepped in, and um, they took our photo from like all different angles. So like. When, when, we, when I play FIFA, like, it's, like, my actual face, not one of those bot characters. That's, oh, that's, I think that's kind of cool. Yeah, for sure. To move it on, talking about, like, your international career, um, how was, like, your, like, the U17 experience at uh, IMG with the residency and stuff? 
Yeah, I touched on it a little bit, but I think that was a really, you know, um, important part of my development as a youth player. Um, I really enjoyed being around Coach uh, John Hackworth. Um, I really had a good relationship with him. And, you know, just being around the top 30 guys, um, being able to go to school, you know, your school was taken care of, you know, I'd go to the cafeteria, food was taken care of. And, you know, it was just kind of focused all about soccer and it's kind of, you know, nerve wracking too. There's a lot of pressure on your shoulders because yes, uh, we're all here together, but that one main goal is the U17 World Cup. So once we uh, qualified, um, you know, our, our main goal was on, on that World Cup. And I thought we did pretty well, um, but you know, our goal now should be for the U17 and U20 World Cup and, and then hopefully leading up to the senior teams to win it. I think we have the players um, to win these, these youth World Cup tournaments. And um, I think we're close. Um, I think we definitely were close within the last U20 and U17. Um, but it was really beneficial. And um, I have a lot of good friends that I made from, from IMG. Um, and, you know, it's, it's something that I wish I could go back to um, mm -hmm. being here now. So what – obviously you traveled a lot of very cool places. The national team has taken you to a lot of cool places. What's the coolest place that it's taking you? Um, our preparation before the uh, World Cup in India was was in Dubai, um, and that was pretty sick. Um, wow! You know, everybody's like driving in Ferraris and stuff over there. <laughs> we saw that like massive uh, skyscraper, the Burj Khalifa, I think, and that was pretty sick to see. And like the mall, there's like an aquarium in it and stuff. So that was pretty fun um, with our preparation. Um, but yeah, I've been really blessed to be able to go, you know, some really nice areas and. And also some some not not so nice areas like India, for example, just to, um, that really gave me some good perspective, you know, on, you know, how uh, blessed I am and thankful for the position that I'm in because, you know, you can see all these nice things like Ferraris and stuff, but to see, you know, kids, you know, playing cricket on the side of the road and on dirt and stuff, you know, that, that I think that gives more perspective. For sure, definitely. So for the U20 World Cup, you were there with Chris Richards. Um, we're just curious because he was on our show and he was talking about how he's <laughs> into music and rapping. Have you ever heard him rap at all? I didn't know that because uh, I've never seen him rap at all before. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know he's a guy that he likes to uh, – he's a big jokester and stuff. <laughs> I really like hanging around with him. He's, he's really funny and – uh, always down for a good time. So I really appreciated hanging out with him at the D20 World Cup. Just a great guy. Definitely. Yeah, was, uh, yeah. Him and uh, Josh Xerxes may be having some music coming out in the future. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh, man. But, yeah, I love so, I'll, be, I'll be the first to listen to that. Yeah, I'll us too. <laughs> so your experience at the U20 World Cup, obviously Tad Ramos is a legendary U.S. player, and he was your coach. Yeah. Uh, did he give you any – advice going into the world cup at all or just how was it playing with him yeah uh, well i think uh todd was a great guy and a, a great coach you know he'd had a lot of experience at the u20 level with you know already a, a few teams before and um I, I really learned a lot from him just in terms of uh, the pressing side of the game he wanted to play such an aggressive style of football you know always pressing and going forward very direct um, where when we get it, we go right away. I really enjoyed that kind of style of football, you know, really to have the game on your terms. Um, and I, I really enjoyed that. And um, he, um, yeah, he was just a great guy to learn from. You can tell he had a lot of experience um, and he really, you know, uh, captivated a room. You know, you really gained his respect um, very quickly and you knew that, you know, this guy didn't mess around. So I really appreciated that. And, um, I think he'll do really well at uh, where he's in Houston Dynamo now. I think he'll do really well with that team. Yeah. Um, obviously, you guys didn't uh, get the resort. I mean, the result that like everyone wanted against um, was it England and like that the U twenty walk was it semi was it no, no it was quarter walk uh, quarter finals. It was I think it was uh, Ecuador we played in the U uh, twenties the quarter finals I believe I'm not sure. Yeah, I no Ecuador <laughs> Venezuela. It was U uh, seventeen World Cup was England. Oh, you trying to? Oh, okay. So how was? Wait, yeah. actually, let's go back to that real quick. How was playing against like, like Phil Foden and like, like yeah, he's like a big time star at City now or whatever. So we we played like Phil Foden, Jaden Sancho, um, Callum Adoy Hudson. Um, I mean, some big players, 
and they were, you could tell that they were quality. They were nice. Like, uh, just, they, they were, they were very good, um, uh, with the ball, but just as a team, like they all, they all play in the premier league, yeah. um, or within the youth teams of their premier leagues. And you could tell that they really like knew each other well. And I mean, you could, you could blindly pick anybody from a, a team in, in the premier league and know, uh, know that you're getting a good player. So they just have such a massive pool to, to, to pull from. I wouldn't be surprised if they, if they win a, a men's world cup within the next uh, 10 years. Yeah, for they sure. just have that much talent. Yeah, they have all, yeah, they have a, a, like everyone's so young too. Like they have such a nice yeah. squad. Um, exactly. moving on to like the first team, like for the U.S. and stuff. Have you talked to like uh, Bear Halter about like involvement, like moving forward? Me personally, no. One of my main focuses now is um, obviously myself here, um, and I think you know you, your work speaks for itself. You know, if I'm you know week in and week out, um, you know performing well here in Belgium, I think then I'll definitely get looks. But also, I'm interested in you know the in the Olympics and qualifying with the Olympic teams and and stuff like that because I don't think we've qualified for the Olympics in around eight I think ten years so I think that definitely has to change and you know to be able to represent your country in an Olympics I think would be you know something that you know you cherish forever but my goal is definitely to get into the senior team you know I see you know some of my friends already pushing up into it um, and you know I think. Um, you know, knowing them and their qualities and, you know, they're very good. I think I, I'm around that level. I think I can get there. Um, it's just about being patient and just, you know, um, doing, doing my thing over here for, for right now. Definitely. All right. So, I mean, that kind of concludes the more like serious questions that we <laughs> had for you. So we're going to move into some more banter, I guess. <laughs> um, so a question is if you could put yourself as a character in any TV show, what TV show would you put yourself in? Um, I think uh, I like Walter White, man, from Breaking Bad. Uh, not like the drugs or anything <laughs> like that, but just like the kind of persona. He, he was just like a, he was a bad MF towards the end of the show in Breaking Bad. And uh, I really, I enjoyed that series. He was pretty dope. Yeah, I, I, that was probably, like, one of the first shows I watched on Netflix, and I'd say it's, yeah. like, one of the best I've seen. Yeah, it's, it's so good. Um, <laughs> If you weren't playing soccer, like, what would you be doing? Like, what's your secret talent? Oh, uh, secret talent. Um, I'm getting pretty good at Call of Duty, Call of Duty Warzone these days. <laughs> we sure run some, some uh, duos. I'm actually yeah, – uh, I'm a god. Actually. I'm trying to. I'm trying to boost my KD up every day, you know. But uh, I like I like video games, and you know, you see the uh, the streaming world and all that stuff. I would love to be like a Nick Merckx right now or something, just chilling, playing video games. Be like phase. <laughs> oh man, that'd be sick. Um, but maybe something associated with the uh, the military as well. My dad was in the military for ten years, um, and you know, I like that. Uh, you know, the idea of representing your country and. Um, yeah, you look at these guys like Navy SEALs and stuff. You see documentaries on them, and they're they're some pretty badass guys. So I would like to maybe do that if I wasn't playing soccer. Yeah, that's 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 pretty that's pretty good. But yeah, Warzone, I can definitely carry a booster like your KD. <laughs> right? No, for sure. I, I this right, is what right. I do. Get Chris just, Richards in there too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you, we gotta get some squads going. <laughs> yeah, I'll be down. So. so you're in the locker room, hypothetical situation here. You're in the locker room before the game and you get past the aux. What's the first song that you're going to put on? Ooh, um, <laughs> I think, I think anything from the new pop smoke album, man. Oh! I think, I think it's a bang. There's some banger songs on that album, bro. <laughs> For sure. What's your favorite song though on that album? Uh, I don't know, man. They're all so good. Uh, I know. <laughs> the one with the woo one uh, with the, yeah the woo I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, yeah, nah, yeah it's the woo nah, I love that I think, yeah. yeah that's for sure my first and then second is something special like I yeah or mood swings it. bro they're, they're it's fire bro <laughs> <laughs> dude, oh I was saying dude this is like the same interview like last week but I literally <laughs> yeah, when, that, when that album dropped two weeks straight it was just it was on repeat just gone just gone yeah bro 
anytime I'm going to train, bro, I turn my uh, my car volume up and I'm just banging out, bro. It's it's, it's so lit. tough. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I can't I can't for for his next album. I can't believe he's 19 too, bro. His voice is like yeah, like he was 19 oh. unfortunately. Yeah, R. he R. sounds exactly like 50 Cent, which is like it's actually so scary. Like, yeah. Just like him, dude. That's oh my god, pop smoke. <laughs> Wait, I'm curious. You said, do you drive to training or do you, can you bike? Because I know biking is like really popular. No, I, I could bike. It's like a four minute drive, but I'm just too lazy to uh, uh, <laughs> to, to bike right now. To be honest. Yeah, I've been biking a lot like during quarantine. Just I I was like, I when I first started in April, I was like, I need something to do. So I just started going yeah. on like 15 mile bike rides a day. Like it's no, I I, bought, I just bought a bike over here. Biking is great, man. It's yeah, like get your mi- mind off of things, and um, yeah. you know, you put 15 miles in, that's like an hour or so, and yeah, you're after that. yeah, it feels good. Nah, Chuck just started like juggling yesterday. You just taught us how, taught us how to juggle. <laughs> yeah, I, I was pretty bored. I taught myself how to juggle. I was on TikTok and I saw a video oh, that like was, juggle like this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I saw a video that was teaching like. It was like, oh, juggling is easy. This is how you do it. So I was like, oh, I could definitely do this. And I taught myself in like an hour. And now I'm pretty good. <laughs> TikTok will have you doing some like weird things, man, with all these like life hacks and stuff. I'm definitely. Are you, are you a fan of TikTok? Uh, I am, but it doesn't matter because it's going to get banned in like 40 days or something because of Trump. Wait, someone, wait, someone told me that like Microsoft ball out like TikTok or something like that. I don't know. If, did you hear that? Uh, I think it's they had like, like the opportunity yeah. to. I don't know. Whatever it is. Some, I don't think they politics. actually did yet. They might still, I think. I'm not sure. It's but... a weird situation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I I never understood that app. Like I I I downloaded it when it was like at like peak level and then I was like, what am I doing? Like I don't understand what's the like the main purpose of this. So I just do it. Yeah. Like, it's really like, easy yeah. to get sucked in. No. And yeah. then every time like Bro. someone see a funny TikTok and they send it to me and my literally my safari like uh, tabs are all TikToks. <laughs> yeah. No, you gotta give TikTok like like a day to get to know you, bro, and then like it just knows like what videos you like. Yeah. And it's it the just algorithm. keeps you wrapped in yeah, for like an hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. You could get on there and you just like you just keep scrolling and scrolling. It's like entertaining. Yeah. You're not like Yeah. Yeah. Um so you said you game a lot. What would you say from Fortnite? What's your favorite dance from Fortnite? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Probably the floss one. I think that one's iconic, you know. Or maybe like the orange. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> next time, next I can't, time you but score. I next time you score, you should hit that. <laughs> yeah. On my first goal, like I uh, uh, in the MLS, I tried to hit like the whoa thing, and <laughs> that was like such a fail. I was like, all right, I'm not dancing anymore after goals. <laughs> he was like, wait, what am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> Nah, bro. that's funny. Did people like? Did people were like making fun of you for that at all? Or yeah, they're like, don't do that again. <laughs> don't, <laughs> sir, don't do that again. <laughs> yeah, that uh, was not good. Who was like the one professional athlete or celebrity that like you really want to meet? Like, regardless if they're dead or alive right now. Um, David Beckham. Yeah, I really want to meet. I meet him. He's like an icon, bro. Like. Um, just the way he did on the field and just like, uh, I just think like the vibe he gives off, off the field, he's just like, he looks like a, just a great guy. And, um, I, I feel like I try to like, uh, replicate a lot of my game after him. Just like the way he like hits a long ball, like with his hand in the air and stuff. Like I tried to do that and yeah, yeah I think Dave Beckham for sure. Nah, for sure. He was, he's, yeah, he was a dog. <laughs> All right, Chris, this has been great. Thank you for coming on and just talking about your career so far and just with the national team and over in Belgium. Um, and then, I don't know, we just really enjoyed getting to know you better. So thank you for coming yeah. on today. Yeah, Same, it was guys. really good. Thanks for, thanks yeah, for coming on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah you're welcome thanks, back. But welcome back anytime. <laughs> yeah, we're yeah, looking forward to sure. seeing you uh, on – well, seeing you play again, hopefully. Well, I mean, for the first time, and we're also trying to see you play for the first team. For the yeah, I appreciate team. it, man. Thanks, bro. Yeah, we wish you the best of luck uh, this season. Thanks, man. And you can come back whenever, man. (laughs) Yeah, thanks, bro. Thanks a lot, man. Have a good one.